Uh, again, Tina has joined our show this year, so we have a segment. Uh, Tina has a segment that I think is actually going to be really interesting to a lot of people, only because it's not something we tackle. We've never tackled really too much here on the show, and it's not something that a lot of people talk about. Uh, but Tina actually has a law degree. And as such, she knows a lot about the law and legal jargon and all that good stuff. So we've we asked her what you know what we could talk about with her that would be of interest. And I I'm actually very much looking forward to this because again, as you know, every year in the NFL we have suspensions for all kinds of different things. You've got your gambling, your your you know, your PED violations, your personal, you know, personal conduct, all that stuff. So Tina right now in a new segment uh, we got called the Corner Office. She's going to explain to us the ins and outs of these NFL uh, rules, regulations for suspensions and for personal, uh, for gambling and for personal conduct. So, Tina, uh, let's get this started. We got a little quick intro for you for the corner office. Check this out. All right. Hi, guys. Um, so just to give you a little snippet, the reason it's called the corner office is some of you may have remembered my little rant about Sauce Gardner last year <laughs> in his corner and pulling jerseys so you can see pads and all of that. So I do love my corners. I love my Pat Sertan, but we thought this would be kind of a different thing to do for and today I'm going to cover personal conduct policy. Now, as you probably, the funny thing is, is when I looked it up, it's only six pages. That's the whole policy in, for the NFL. But it's very in-depth. It's very, it, there's a lot of things in and out, who it belongs to, who it doesn't, who it affects. So just to get it all down, who does the conduct policy apply to? It applies to owners, coaches, players, other team employees, game officials, league office employees, and employees of the NFL films and NFL network. So it applies to all of them. It's not just a player policy. Um, and it was issued pursuant to the commissioner's authority. A lot of people know like Goodell was doing a lot of this at one time, but his authority that is given to him under the Constitution and the bylaws of the NFL, and also under the NFL Players Association and the uh, collective bargaining agreement. Okay, so the policies can be updated every year. They can change things. They can move things around. There is a conduct committee. Also, nine member, nine NFL owners or their representatives sit on that conduct committee. And they're the ones that go through and decide whether or not they need to update the policy, make changes, et cetera. I tried to figure out, find out who was on it. The last one I could see was from 2014. And it was like Dallas, the Bears, Atlanta. Um, I think Titans were on it. So there's nine members, seven are NFL owners or the reps, and two are ex-players. So that's who sits on the committee. Now, who does it apply to? Okay. And this is where it's kind of interesting. And I'll talk about something later, too. Um, it applies to players under contract, um, all players selected in the draft, undrafted rookies, anyone who went to the scouting combine, all unsigned vets who were under contract the year before, and all prospective players once they begin negotiations with a team. Okay, so that's who it applies to. And right now, they're talking about they may make a change in the 2023 policy that would be, it would apply to, they're trying to possibly make it apply to Anyone at any time, it could also backdate. So, for instance, uh, we had a couple of people in the draft who had some issues with the law. 
and they were brought up on various charges and claims, if the new change goes into effect, it could also apply to them. Okay. So that's one that's being tossed around quite a bit right now. So, and I'll explain why I think they want to make that change. Okay. So a lot of, you know, all the basic ones, like, uh, domestic violence, assault, sexual assault, um, violent or threatening behavior. Um, the list is just, as you can see, the list is just obnoxious. Um, you, stalking or harassment, illegal possession of a gun, um, also or legal possession of a gun in a workplace. Um, uh, let's see. Illegal possession, use, or distribution of alcohol or drugs. It's the same for steroids and performance. Uh, cruelty to animals. Crimes of dishonesty. Blackmail, extortion, fraud. All of those apply. Um, theft crimes. Disorderly conduct. So if someone goes to a protest and they're arrested for disorderly conduct, that would also apply to them. Um, crimes against law enforcement, obstructing, resisting arrest, those kinds of things. The two that a lot of people seem to focus on the most are the ones that I would call the loosey-goosey ones, which is conduct that poses a genuine danger to the safety and well-being of another person. And this is the big one. Conduct that undermines or puts at risk the integrity of the NFL, the NFL clubs, or NFL personnel. So essentially, even if you didn't commit any of the other ones that I said, if something happens and an investigation is put forward, it's a catch-all. They can get you for other things too. So, and that one last one that I talked about, that's one where I'm going to talk a little bit about investigations. If you don't go along with the investigations, then I think that's where they're going to get you. Okay. So there's other things in there. There's, it talks about like you can get um, help and training and treatment and family members can get that and all of that. So investigations. So the way the conduct policy says is that you as a player or an NFL employee, if you hear of an instance of any of those things that happened, I talked about earlier, if you're aware of a violation, you have to report it to the NFL, even if it's only an allegation, okay? And so the way it's going to work is, and we talk about this comes up in the media all the time, like why are they investigating this when law enforcement is doing their own investigation? And that's exactly it. It's a two-sided investigation. Law enforcement, may, if it's assault or something like that, law enforcement is going to have their own investigation. And then the NFL will have their investigation. And they will get copies of the reports. They will do the, get witness statements, all of this. But what happens is when they get word of a violation, they're going to put they're going to put someone in place. It's called a disciplinary officer. And that disciplinary officer now has the right to do the investigation as if he was a law enforcement officer. He can get witness statements. He can get text messages. He can get all of that in addition to what the NFL, what the law enforcement side is doing. And it's not just law enforcement, it's grand juries, it's charges, it's everything. And if the NFL finds out that you did not put forth information that you knew about this investigation, they can bring you up on charges for violating the personal conduct policy. Because to go back to what I said before, that that's all, Anything that could undermine the integrity of the NFL is their catch-all. Okay. I know I gave you guys a lot of information right there. Um, there's more they can get. I mean, they can go into everything. But one thing also that I think a lot of people have talked about is, and I want to mention this because under the law enforcement, there are rules. And the big one that everyone knows is you have the right to not incriminate yourself in a criminal investigation. 
That is not true in the NFL. Remember, the NFL is an employer. That is a workplace situation. So the NFL can compel players and employees to give statements. It's just the way that it works. And it's anything, club sponsored activities, it's at the facility, it's training camp, they're on a plane, they're at the hotel, anything and everything that's NFL related, you see something or you hear of something that's a violation of the policy, you have to, you have to tell the NFL about, okay? So this is what was interesting to me is in the player policy, like we always hear about, oh, we got six game suspension, et cetera, et cetera. This guy got three, this guy got that. The reason why I kind of looked into it is I wanted to see like, what does the policy actually say about those suspensions? And so what it says is that the investigation goes to the D, I'll call him a DO, disciplinary officer. That disciplinary officer does the investigations. Now in the policy, what would happen is if you have a violation of that policy, you can be placed on paid administrative leave, even if you've been formally charged. Um, and charges are grand jury indictment, formal charges by prosecution, arraignment, all of this. Investigations, all of this is reasons why the NFL can put someone on uh, paid leave. Um, so here's the thing. So they cannot attend games, but they can attend meetings, workouts, and therapy or rehab, and other permitted non-football activities at the facility as long as the team agrees to it. So that's why sometimes you will see, like if someone's under an investigation under suspension, some teams will let them be at the facility and some teams won't. That's, that is literally up to the, the team, whether they want to do that or not. Okay. So it goes through the whole process. The DO gets in, he does his investigation. He then, once he makes his decision, he lets the player know what his decision is. Once he makes that decision, then the player, the commissioner, the NFL Players Association can all file an appeal on that decision by the disciplinary officer. Now, here's a, here's a situation that I don't think a lot of people knew. So the whole reason why they had the DO is because Goodell was getting in trouble because they thought he was playing favorites when how he was making his decisions. So what it comes down to is the DO is the one who decides whether or not the person should be suspended or not after the investigation. If the DO says, no, this doesn't warrant a suspension, the commissioner and the Players Association can't do anything about it. It's done. He moves on. But they can reduce it based on mitigating factors. And there's all kinds of mitigating factors. I mean, the list is on and on and on. But the biggest one that I found, the biggest mitigating factor is whether or not you've had, this is your first offense or not. If this is not your first, and by first offense, I don't mean it's the first time you didn't pass a PED test. It's, were you involved in, an assault was it that like each time or as i noted earlier like if you don't tell the nfl you heard something that's an offense too so then if you get caught on ped then you're that's where the mitigating factors come in okay so different things probationary period um when they notify the person of their investigation and discipline they can, there's a number of things they can do. They can get probationary period. Um, they also will be told what the conditions are for them to be reinstated. Or if they've been indefinitely banished from the NFL, what they can do to get back into the NFL. Um, so ownership. Now, as I said before, ownership, clubs, everybody else, they're also held to this policy too. So if they violate it, they are going to be held to a stricter standard and that actually shows up in the gambling policy. 
All right. So first offense, baseline suspension without pay for six games. That is for, um, I'm looking, criminal assault or battery of a felony charge. You do that, one of those, Camara, we'll talk about him in more detail. Felony charge, six games, automatic. Um, I'm going to call them the family violence situations. That's going to be like domestic violence, dating violence, child abuse, those types of situations. Sexual violence involving physical force or committed against someone who's incapable of consent, i.e. the person was under the influence. They weren't able to give consent or they didn't understand what was going on. Um, those are the only three that actually say, if you do this, you get this. Everything else is all subjective and it's all based on the investigation, mitigating factors, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of why <laughs> when we're going through some of these suspensions, you can see why different things happen. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> I'm trying to see if there was anything else I wanted to talk about. Okay. Now, so perfect example of this is Alvin Kamara. Okay. Under the policy, he was supposed to get six game suspension, but we all know he got a three game suspension. So there were some mitigating factors, which can be, and I don't know all of the ins and outs of Kamara's arrest and what happened and all of that, but that's what I'm talking about where the DO can say it's six games because that's what he's told under here. Kamara committed assault. That's what he was being charged with in the criminal investigation. So, but there must have been some kind of mitigating factors from the commissioner that made him say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to bring this down to three. So there's that. All right. Any questions? Anything? I, I'm sorry. I've been talking and I, I want to see if there's any comments. Well, I don't know. No, I, the fact is, and I know maybe I'm actually very interested in everything you have to say, because I've always wondered what goes into any of these decisions and what goes into any and all of this stuff that where they make these decisions based on the fact that you have, you know, three games for this or seven games for this or half a season for this or, you know, a whole year for some gambling ones. So, yeah. Right. I, so again, what I would I know, say is the yeah, reason, yeah. so for instance, like Kamara, six games automatically, that's what you're supposed to get for your baseline. First offense. Right. Okay, so the fact that it got taken down to three means right. that one, there was something else in their investigation. And here's the thing, the investigation that they did doesn't necessarily, can come up with things that law enforcement did not come up with. And they don't right. have to give it, they usually will give it to the law enforcement. So that's the reason, but the reason why I also wanted to note this, let's talk about Deshaun Watson, okay? Right. Technically, under the rules, because what he was accused, and here's the thing, it's not, it does not have to be actual charges. You don't, it doesn't have to be an indictment, doesn't have to be grand jury, doesn't have to be anything. It can literally be this, I heard this, I saw this, this right. guy was talking about this, and that starts the investigation. So that's why... He started with, well, is he going to get a year? Is he going to get under the policy? He got six games. Right. So it's it's a very interesting and it's all very fact specific and like looking right. at it. So that's why some of the more interesting ones for me is we all remember Spygate and all of that. Yeah. Like, yeah. But that was back when Godel was doing the investigate it was his office investigating these things it was right. his office deciding what was going on so that's why they made the change to the disciplinary officer and that is an independent person that is agreed to by both the nfl and the players association so 
they're independent. They do their own investigations. They can do and go and talk to witnesses. And you can also get in trouble if they think you're tampering with witnesses or trying to intimidate witnesses into right. not giving statements. That will also get you another ding and bring you under the personal conduct policy. Um, one real quick. We talked about gambling. Okay. I'm going to read you this thing that came and then I'm going to just break it down. Very simple. All NFL personnel are prohibited from placing, soliciting, or facilitating any bet, whether directly or indirectly, through a third party on any NFL game, practice, or other event. And this includes game outcomes, stats, scores, individual performances or any other wagers okay wow that's yeah. the policy now here's to break it down easily on that one. Oh, and they don't have any it's not like assault or domestic violence or that there is no minimum when it comes to the gambling policy they okay. have no stated um, minimums, maximums, anything. And I, I think I, I, I'm going to say exactly why I think it is. But here's the six rules when it comes to gambling. Don't bet on the right. NFL. Right. Don't gamble at a facility, traveling on right. the road, or staying at the team hotel. Don't have someone else do it for you. <laughs> don't share any inside information. And don't right. visit, go in, or use a sports book during the season <laughs> and don't right. play fantasy football. <laughs> oh, okay, now, right. the funny thing is, is, is so th they can't bet on NFL games. That's right. essentially what it is. Right. Uh, employees of the NFL, so coaches, uh, the legal office, all those guys, they can't yeah. bet on any. In, uh, any major league sports, sports teams. Gotcha. It's across okay. the board for them. Okay. okay. Here's the reason why I think this policy is exactly the way that this policy is. And I'm going to refer oh. back to the 1990s and the late 1990s when there was that big brouhaha that it went up during NBA basketball when they found out that some of the uh, refs were betting on games. And uh, again, yes. it goes back to Violation of this gambling about policy that. is of okay. is is takes into the integrity of the game of the people and everything. So they don't want players in any way to make it seem like they're trying right. to throw games or trying right. to make money off the product, et cetera, et cetera. So I do think it's weird and a little disingenuous that um the nf one of the nfl sponsors is DraftKings. so no nope. players can't do it whole, but you can tell yeah. everybody else to do it <laughs> yeah and that's a whole other topic for another time because believe me i'd like to get into that at some point during this season because yeah i think that's absolutely hilarious that your biggest sponsor is DraftKings, but you definitely frown against betting so uh, definitely a, a contrast a conflict uh, i don't whatever you want to call that but yeah uh, well, listen, Tina, I want to thank you because that, I mean, that's a lot of information, but I think it's great. Uh, I appreciate all your knowledge on this. Like I said, I would I have no idea how to break that down or read that properly or anything like that. So uh, you will be hearing more from Tina in the coming weeks. Obviously, the corner office will be on every week.